This is the Breviary of Natural Philosophy, compiled by the unlettered scholar Thomas Carnock, student in the most worthy science of astronomy and philosophy, the 1st of January, Anno Domini, 1557. Anno Domini, 1557, the first day of the new year. This treatise was begun as after may appear. The Book Speaketh Come hither, my children, of this discipline, which in natural philosophy have spent so long time. To ease your painful study I am well willed, and by the grace of God it shall be fulfilled. If he in me, my author, will shed one drop of grace, the better he shall finish me, and in shorter space. And if you will know what I am surely, I am named the Breviary of Natural Philosophy, declaring all vessels and instruments which in this science serve our intents. For more things belong unto the same, more than any author hath written the name, which hath brought many a one in great doubt, what is the implement that longeth thereabout? Wherefore, in good order, I will anon declare what instruments for our art you need to prepare. The Preface of the Author Go forth, little book, in volume but small, yet hast thou in thee that is not in them all, for satisfying the minds of the students in this art. Then art thou worth as many books as will lie in a cart. Glad may he be that hath thee in his keeping, for he may find through diligent seeking all things in thee which shall be necessary as vessels and instruments belonging to alchemy, which would set many a man's heart on fire to have the same knowledge they have so great desire. And no mervel, though they be glad and fain, for they have spent many a pound in vain, in making of vessels of many diverse sorts, and have brought them out of many strange ports, because they did not well understand that all things we need we have in England. Now think you that this will not save many a mark unto those that have wrestled so long in our work? Yes, some would spend all the money in their pouch if they knew but this or half so much. Wherefore of pity I will no longer refrain, but declare all things their purpose to attain. Wherefore, if you do happen on my book, either by casualty hook or by crook, yet pray for my soul, when I am dead and rotten, that of alchemy science the door hath left open, sufficient for thee if thou have any brain. Now sharpen thy wits, that thou mayest it attain. THE FIRST CHAPTER Now will I declare all things at large, of implements of this work, and what is the charge. And first with the potter I will begin, which cannot make that which he hath never seen. Whether that thy vessels be made to thy mind, stand by while he worketh more surety to find, and shew him what to do by some sign or similitude, and if his wits be not too dull nor rude, he will understand what thou dost mean. For I think few potters within this realm have made at any such time such cunning ware, as we for our science do fashion and prepare. And when he hath formed them unto thy purpose, for what occasion thou needest not disclose, but if he say unto you, Good master mine, tell me for what purpose or wet engine, Shall these vessels serve that thou cause me to make? For all my life, hitherto I dare undertake, I never formed such, nor the like of them. Yet are they but plain, without wrinkle or hem. One within another, it is a pretty feat, the third without them to guide up the heat. Then say unto him, to satisfy his mind, that ye have a father which is somewhat blind who, if it please God, you will endeavor to still a water his blindness to dissever. 
which is the elixir of life, as wise men say. And in this doing God send me my prey. Then will he say, this or the like, I pray God to send ye that which you seek. And thus with the potter thou hast now done, without thou break thy pots with the heat of the sun, which, if it do, it turns thee to pain, and there is no way but to make them new again. As soon as with a potter thou hast made an end, then with a joiner thou must condescend, who also must have this counsel and wit, to make a tabernacle the vessel to sit, which will be also in great doubt, for what purpose it will serve about, in that he never made nor framed none such, although it be made like to a hutch. Then tell him a tale of a roasted horse, unto the which he will have no remorse, and laugh and say it is a burrow for a fox, although it be made sure with keys and locks. And thus with a joiner thou hast made an end, without thou set it on fire as I did mine. As for glassmakers, they be scant in this land, yet one there is as I do understand, and in Sussex is now his habitation. At Chinfold he works of his occupation. To go to him it is necessary and meet, or send a servant that is discreet, and desire him in most humble wise to blow thee a glass after thy device. It were worth many an arm or a leg, he could shape it like to an egg, to open and to close, as close as a hair. If thou have such one, thou needest not fear. Yet, if thou hadst a number into store, it is thee better, for store is no sore. THE SECOND CHAPTER Now, Lord, of thy grace I beseech thee, suffer me to finish my pretense in this rude study. For this, nor aught else, without thy help can be done, as neither the conjunction of sun nor moon. Nor yet other planets can motion themselves an hour without thy providence and thy divine power. Wherefore, in all things that we do begin, let us with prayer call for help of him, that he bring our doings to effect, which must be done very circumspect. Wherefore, if you think to obtain your intent, fear God and keep his commandment, and beware of pride and let it pass, and never be looking too much in thy glass. Deceive no man with false measure, for truly that is ill-gotten treasure. But let thy weight be true and just, for weight and measure every man must unto his neighbor yield uprightly, and so must thou in the work of philosophy. And also feed him which is hungry, and give him drink which is thirsty. Give liberally, I say, as riches do arise, and from thirsty body turn not away thy eyes. What and two poor men at one time come unto thee and say, Master, for the love of God and Our Lady, give us your charity whatsoever you please, for we have not one penny to do us ease, and we are now ready to the sea pressed, where we must abide three months at the least, all which time to land we shall not pass, no, although our ship be made but of glass but all tempest of the air we must abide, and in dangerous roads many times to ride. Bread shall we have none, nor yet other food, but only fair water descending from a cloud. The moon shall us burn so in process of time, that we shall be as black as men of Eind, but shortly we shall pass into another climate, where we shall receive a more pure estate. For this our sins we make our purgatory, for the which we shall receive a spiritual body, a body, I say, which if it should be sold, truly I say it is worth his weight in gold. Son, give these two one penny in their journey to drink, and thou shalt speed the better truly as I think. 
The Third Chapter Now have I good will largely to write, although I can but slenderly indite. But whether I can or cannot, indeed, with the chapter of fire I will proceed, which, if thou knowest not how to govern and keep, thou wert as good go to bed and sleep as to be cumbered therewith about. And therefore I put thee most certainly out of doubt. For when I studied this science as thou doest now, I fell to practice, by God I vow. I was never so troubled in all my life before, as intending to my fire both midday, eve, and morn, and all to keep it at an even stay. It hath wrought me woe more than I will say. Yet one thing of truth I will thee tell, what great mishap unto my work befell. It was upon a New Year's day at noon. My tabernacle caught fire. It was soon done. For within an hour it was right well, and straight of fire I had a smell. I ran up to my work right, and when I came it was on a fire light. Then was I in such fear that I began to stagger, as if I had been wounded to the heart by a dagger. And can you blame me? No, I think not much, for if I had been a man anything rich, I had rather have given a hundred marks to the poor, rather than that hap should have chanced that hour. For I was well onward of my work truly. God saved my master's life, for when he thought to die, he gave me his work and made me his heir. Wherefore always he shall have my prayer. I obtained his grace the date here from not to vary in the first and second year of King Philip and Queen Mary. Yet lewdly I lost it as I have you told, and so I began the new and forgot the old. Yet many a night after I could not sleep in bed, for ever that mischance troubled my head, and fear thereof I would not abide again. No, though I should reap a double gain, wherefore my charge rose to a greater sum, as in hiring of a good stout groom, which might abide to watch and give attendance. Yet oftentimes he did me displeasance, and would sleep so long till the fire went out. Then would the knave, that horse and lout, cast in tallow to make the fire burn quicker, which when I knew made me more sicker. And thus was I cumbered with a drunken sot, that with his hasty fire made my work too hot and with his sloth again he set my work behind. For remedy thereof to quiet my mind, I thrust him out of doors and took myself the pain. Although it be troublesome, it is the more certain. For servants do not pass how our works do frame, but have more delight to play and to game. A good servant, saith Solomon, let him be unto thee, as thine own heart in each degree. For it is precious a faithful servant to find. Esteem him above treasure, if he be to thy mind. Not wretchless, but sober, wise and quiet. Such a one were even more for my diet. Thus having warned thee of an ill servant sufficient, but a good servant is for our intent. The Fourth Chapter When my man was gone, I began it anew, And old troubles then in my mind did renew, As to break sleep oftentimes in the night, For fear that my work went not aright. And oftentimes I was in great doubt, Lest that in the night my fire should go out, Or that it should give too much heat. The pensiveness thereof made me to break sleep. And also in the day, lest it should miscarry, it hath made my mind oftentimes to vary. Wherefore, if thou wilt follow my raid, see thy fire safe when thou goest to bed. At midnight also, when thou dost arise, and in so doing I judge thee to be wise. Beware that thy fire do no man harm, 
For thou knowest many times a man's house and barn have been set on fire by mischance, and specially when a fool hath the governance. Our fire is chargeable and will amount above three pound a week who hath list to cast account, which is chargeable to many a poor man, and specially to me, as I tell can, and Geber bids poor men be content. Haec scientia paupori et agento non convenit, said Portius Estilius in Nemica, and bids them beware, because their money they may not well spare. For thou must have fires more than one or two. What they be, George Ripley, will thee show. Above a hundred pounds truly did I spend, only in fire, ere nine months came to an end. But indeed I began, when all things were dear, both tallow, candle, wood, coal, and fire, which charges to bear sometimes I have sold, now a jewel, and then a ring of gold. And when I was within a month's reckoning, wars were proclaimed against the French king. Then a gentleman, that ought me great malice, caused me to be pressed to go serve at Callis, when I saw there was none other boot, but that I must go, spite of my heart toot. In my fury I took a hatchet in my hand, and break all my work, whereas it did stand. And as for my pots, I knocked them together, and also my glasses into many a shiver. The crow's head began to appear as black as yet, yet in my fury I did nothing let, but with my work made such a furious fare that the quintessence flew forth in the air. Farewell, quoth I, and seeing thou art gone, surely I will never cast my falchion. To procure thee again to put me to hindrance without it be my fortune and chance to speak with my good master, or that I die. Master I.S. his name is Trulé. Nigh the city of Salisbury his dwelling is, a spiritual man forsooth he is, for whose prosperity I am bound to pray, for that he was my tutor many a day, and understood as much of philosophy as ever did Arnold or Raymond Lully. Geber, Hermes, Arda, nor yet King Caleb understood no more than my good master did. I travel this realm east and west over, Yet found I not the like between the mount and Dover, but only a monk, of whom I'll speak anon. Each of them had accomplished our white stone, but yet to the red work they never came near. The cause hereafter more plainly shall appear. And thus, when I had taken all these pains, and then could not reap the fruit of my gains, I thought to myself so to set out this work, that others by fortune might hit right the mark. The Fifth Chapter I am sorry I have nothing to requite my master's gentleness, but only this book, a little short treatise, which I dare say shall as welcome be to him as if I had sent him a couple of milk him. And here for his sake I will disclose unto thee a great secret, which by God and the Trinity, since that our Lord this world first began, was it not so opened I dare lay my hand? No, all the philosophers which were before this day never knew this secret, I dare boldly say. And now to obtain thy purpose more rather, let thy fire be as temperate as the bath of the bather, Oh, what a goodly and profitable instrument is the bath of the bath for our fiery intent. To seek all the world throughout I should not find for profit and liberty a fire more fit to my mind. Go or ride, where you list, for the space of a year thou needest not care for the mending of thy fire. A monk of bath, which of that house was prior, told me in secret he occupied none other fire, to whom I gave credit even at the first season, because it depended upon very good reason. 
He had our stone, our medicine, our elixir and all, which when the abbey was suppressed he hid in a wall. And ten days after he went to fetch it out, and there he found but the stopple of a clout. Then he told me he was in such an agony that for the loss thereof he thought he should be frenzy, and a toy took him in the head to run such a race that many a year after he had no settling place. And more, he is dark and cannot see, but hath a boy to lead him through the country. I happened to come on a day whereas he was, and by a word or two that he let pass, I understood straight he was a philosopher, for the which cause I drew to him near. And when the company was all gone, and none but his boy and he and I alone, Master, quoth I, for the love of God and charity, teach me the secrets of natural philosophy. No, son, quoth he, I know not what thou art, and shall I reveal to thee such a precious art? No man by me shall get such gains, no, not my boy, which taketh with me such pains, that to disclose it lies not in my bands, for I must surrender it into the Lord's hands, because I hear not of one that hath the fame, which lifts up his mind and is apt for the same, which, if I could find, I would, ere I die, reveal to him that same great mystery. Yet one there is, about the city of Salisbury, a young man of the age of eight and twenty. Carnock is his name, of Tenet that isle. His praise and commendations soundeth many a mile. That, for a young man, he is toward and apt, in all the seven liberal sciences set none apart. But of each of them he hath much or little, whereof in our science he may claim a title. His praise spreads also for his good inditing, and of some of his doings I have heard the reciting, both of prose and metre, and of verse also, and sure I commend him for his first show. I think Chaucer at his years was not the like, and skeleton at his years was further to seek. Wherefore, for his knowledge, gravity, and wit, he may well be crowned poet laureate. Cease, father, quoth I, and hear me speak, for my name is Carnock, upon whom you treat. But this which you say to me is great wonder, for these qualities and I am far asunder. I am no such man as you have made reckoning, but you shall speak for me when I go a-wiving. Your praise will make me speed, though it be not true, nor yet my substance worth an old horseshoe. Is your name Carnock, and the same man? Yes, sir, quoth I. Then stumbled he to give me his hand, and talked an hour with me in the philosopher's speech, and heard that in no question I was to seek. My son, quoth he, let me have thy prayer, for of this science I will make thee mine heir. Boy, quoth he, lead me into some secret place, and then depart for a certain space, until this man and I have talked together. Which being done, quoth he, now, gentle brother, will you with me to-morrow be content, faithfully to receive the blessed sacrament? Upon this oath that I shall hear you give, for nay gold nor silver as long as you live, neither for love you bear towards your kin, nor yet to no great man preferment to win, that you disclose the secret that I shall you teach, neither by writing nor by no swift speech, but only to him which you be sure hath ever searched after the secrets of nature. To him you may reveal the secrets of this art, under the covering of philosophy, before this world you depart. What answer will you give me? Let me hear. Master, quoth I, I grant your desire. Then, son, quoth he, keep this oath I charge thee well, as thinkest to be saved from the pit of hell.
The next day we went to church, and after our devotions, a priest of his gentleness heard both our confessions. Which being done, to the Mass straight we went, and he ministered to us the Holy Sacrament. But he never wist what we meant therein, for with a contrary reason I did him blame. And so home to dinner we went to our host, all which refreshing I paid for the cost. When dinner was done, we walked in a field large and plain, where people passed by but field. And when we were in the midst, Boy, quoth he, go pick a thistle, and come not again before I for thee whistle. Now, master, quoth I, the coast from here's is clear. Then, quoth he, my son, hearken in thine ear. And within three or four words he revealed unto me, of minerals prudence, the great mystery, which when I heard, my spirits were ravished for joy. The Grecians were never gladder for the winning of Troy. As I was then, remembering my good master through, for even the self-same secret he did me show. Nine days and no more I tarried with him, sure, but Lord, in this time what secrets of nature he opened to me at diverse sundry times, as partly I have told thee in my former rhymes. The rest is not to be written on pain of damnation, or else in this book truly I would make relation. Now, Father, quote I, I will depart, you fro, and for you I will pray, whithersoever I go. Son, quoth he, God's blessing go with thee and thine, and if thou speed well, let me hear of thee again. The Sixth Chapter When I was gone a mile or two abroad, with fervent prayer I praised the Lord, giving him thanks for that prosperous journey, which was more rather to me than an hundred pound in money. Surely, quoth I, my master shall know all this, or else my brains shall serve me amiss. Which, if they were so good as the monk made mention, then would I write to my master with a better invention. O oh Lord, quoth I, what a solemn oath was this given! Surely in sheets of brass it is worthy to be graven, for a perpetual memory ever to remain among the philosophers for an oath certain. And when I was two days' journey homeward, to ask him a question to him again I fared, which I had forgotten, and would not for my land, but that doubt truly I might understand. I thought it not much to go back with all speed to seek him out, and to the house where I left him I yede, and there in a chamber anon I found him out, praying upon his beads very devout. Father, quoth I, a word with you I do beseech. Who is that? quoth he. My son Carnock by his speech. Yeah, forsooth, quoth I, I am come back to you, desiring you heartily to tell me one thing true, which is this. Who was in philosophy your tutor, and of that secret to you the revealer? Mary, quoth he, and speak it with hearty joy. Forsooth, it was Ripley the canon, his boy. Then I remembered my good master again, which told me he did it never attain of no manner of man, but of God he put it in his head, as he for it was thinking lying in his bed. And thus I tarried with him all that night, and made him as good cheer as I might. In the morning I took my leave of him to depart, and in the process of time came home with a merry heart. But that mirth was shortly turned to care, for as I have told you, so my work did fare. Once I set it on fire, which did me much woe, and after my man hindered me a month or two, yet the gentleman did me more spite than the rest, as when he made me from work to be pressed. Then Bedlam could not hold me, I was so fret. 
but sauced at my work with a great hatchet. Raising my pots and my glasses all together, I wish they cost me more, or I got them thither. The ashes with my spur flew all about. One fire I spilt, and the other I put out. All the rubbish to the dunghill I carried in a sack, and the next day I took my coats, with the cross at the back, and forth I went to serve a soldier's Rome. And surely, quoth I, there shall come the day of Dome, before I practice again to be a philosopher. Wherefore have me commended to my good master. And now my students in this art, my promise I have kept justly, and that you shall find true when you understand me truly. Which before that day never think to speed, for a plainer book than this never desire to read. And true it is also if you can pick it out, but it is not for every cart slave or lout. This to understand, know though his wits were fine, for it shall be hard enough for a very good divine to consider our meaning of this worthy science, but in the study of it he hath taken great diligence. Now for my good master and me I desire you to pray, and if God spare me life, I will mend this another day. Finished the 20th of July, 1557 By the unlettered scholar Thomas Carnock, student in the most worthy science of astronomy and philosophy. Here are the two enigmas written by Thomas Carnock in 1572, appended by Elias Ashmole. More notes follow these two enigmae. Enigma ad alchemiam. When seven times twenty-six had run their race, then nature discovered his black face. But when an hundred and fifty had overcome him in fight, he made him wash his face white and bright. Then came thirty-six with great royalty, and made black and white a way to flee. Methought he was a prince of honor, for he was all in golden armor, and on his head a crown of gold that for no riches it might be sold. Which till I saw my heart was cold to think at length who should win the field till black and white to red did yield. Then heartily to God did I pray that ever I saw that joyful day. 1572. T. Carnock. Enigma de Alchemiae. When seven times twenty-six had run their race, then nature discovered his black face. But with a hundred and fifty came in with great lust, and made black nigh to fly the coast. Yet one came after, and brought thirty of great might, which made black and white to flee quick. Methought he was a prince of honor, for he was all in golden armor, and on his head a crown of gold, that for no riches it might be sold. And truly with no philosopher I do mock. For I did it myself, Thomas Carnock. Therefore God comfort thee in thy work, For all our writings are very dark. Despise all books and them defy, Wherein is nothing but recipe et acipe. Few learned men within this realm Can tell thee aright what I do mean. I could find never man but one which could teach me the secrets of our stone, and that was a priest in the close of Salisbury. God rest his soul in heaven full merry. 1572 T. Carnock The Breviary of Natural Philosophy is the first where Elias Ashmole actually includes multiple pieces by the same author sandwiched right together that were originally published separately. Um, further, there are extra fragments and extra information notes 
about Thomas Carnock. It's very interesting stuff if one has the curiosity. All this additional content is certainly a rabbit hole to go down, and it's food for another video. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this recording, please leave a comment and click the like button. Really appreciate everyone's thoughts, and I'd love to do more of them. Thank you very much.